Hello, thank you for joining us for part three of our three-part series on frictional heating during breaking. Here we will be covering post-processing techniques which can be beneficial for troubleshooting and validation. So let's move over to mechanical and dive right into it. Here we'll start with total deformation, which we can see has a nice contour going out to the edge of the cylindrical rotor. Due to the cylindrical nature and rotation of this model, visualizing deformations can be very difficult, as we will see in a second. To better visualize our results, we're going to go up to the results tab and make sure we have the scale set to one or true scale. Then we can use the results set to select a portion of our deformation plot and create an animation which will allow us to see the mesh moving and sliding. We can see here that during the ramp up phase, there's a slow increase in the deformation and the mesh is sliding past the stationary pads. This is easy to visualize in the center where we can see the rotation. The issue here is the contours, which change as the nodes move away from and towards their original positions, which is apparent when we look at the oscillating nature of the maximum deformation in the plot. Pausing our animation, we can move on to the rotational degrees and see how much our joint has rotated throughout the analysis. We can see here that after three seconds, we become rather stationary, and thus around this time, we will have seen the rotor stop. Additionally, we can use the same joint to look at the rotational velocity throughout the analysis. Most important to us is to get to this final velocity of approximately zero RPMs and our velocity around 0.1 seconds where we're targeting 524 RPMs. We can also use this joint to look at our angular acceleration and see that we're approaching zero after about one second and thus, we're pretty steady in our deceleration of the rotor. Also note the nice curve between 0 and 0 0.1 seconds, which shows the acceleration input and that sine or half sine wave that we use to institute the necessary RPMs. Some spurious results are seen around 0 0.1 seconds as we're applying the initial brake force, as this is expected due to some instability, but this does not adversely affect our results. Moving along, we can start to look at temperature results on our thermally significant components. Here we'll actually go to the highest temperature and see that on the friction surface is where we see the largest values for the rotor. This will be consistent for the pads, but one thing we'll notice is that there's high contours at the leading edge of friction. Additionally, we can see increased temperatures in the backing plates compared to the ambient temperature of 25 degrees C. This means that these are thermally significant and conduction is occurring through the pad into the plate. Additional thermal results are available to look at, say, the convection on the rotors, the convection on the pads, and the radiation on the pads throughout the analysis. These results can be obtained by dragging and dropping our inputs onto the solution tab or by inserting a result probe. Next, we can use our contact results for the outer and inner pads to look at some more precise values or results within them. Here we can see the sliding distance for a single friction surface and see that it grows with the rotation of the rotor. Again, we see a nice contour from the inner radius to the outer radius which is consistent for both friction surfaces. 
Additionally, we can look at things like frictional stress and pressure to see how our contact surface are, surfaces are behaving during sliding. Lastly, we're going to actually go into our solution information, look at our solver output, and use control F to find the IDs of our contact surfaces. Here we can see frictional, frictional, with contact numbers of 110, 109, 112, and 111. I'm interested in contact IDs 109 and 111, which I record for use later. With these IDs, I insert user-defined results here, and I calculate a couple of values. First is the frictional dissipation, which I use the item type element type ID 109 and the output result SMIS 18 to get. Then I use the same element type ID 109 to get the contact area at each moment in time with NMISC 58. Using these two results, I can get the frictional heating value for each of them by multiplying them together. You'll notice frick heat out and frick area out are my identifiers specified earlier in each of these results. Now, let's evaluate and look at our results. We're going to look at 0.11 seconds, which is the moment of time when we have full force applied on the brake pad. The values here are dependent on the values from our previous two components where we've used a unit system of millimeters tons, therefore our contact area is in millimeters and our frictional dissipation is in watts per millimeter squared. Therefore, we get a wattage output per contact element here at the frictional surface. We notice that our highest values are seen when we have the most rotation at the friction surface and we slowly reduce down to a value of approximately zero as the rotation stops. An additional thing to note is that we've used a linear elastic material for all materials in this model. This means that our plastic heating or PHEA output is zero. With these tools, you'll be able to validate your analysis and produce temperature plots like this. Thank you for taking the time to watch with us today, and I hope you have fun recreating this analysis on your own.